It's certainly a privilege to be here this day and to spend the day with family, but also with the congregation here. Part of the things that we enjoy about coming to uh, Claremore is to be able to spend the time with family, obviously, but also we have gotten to know this congregation very well and over the years, and it's a real privilege to be here with you and to be a part of this con congregation. I go out and I preach here and there almost every Sunday, it seems like. It, it kind of comes and goes, really. There for be a while, it's feast or famine, you know. It's one of those things where I'm sitting at home thinking, well, I sure wish I was somewhere preaching. And then there are other times when it's just every week, week after week after week, and, uh, and sometimes it kind of gets gold traveling all these different places. Here about um, three or four weeks ago, I was in, uh, I think, five congregations in 15 days. So, I mean, you know, it, it got a little bit old. But nonetheless, it is always a privilege to be with this congregation. That's the point I was really making. And I appreciate so much this congregation and your stand for the truth. Russ texted me yesterday and asked me if I would uh, preach, and I said, well, yeah, I'll, I'll preach about the judgment tomorrow night. And, uh, and he said, well, you can't do that. I'm doing that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then I had to come up with something else. And I didn't even think about it being Mother's Day, although I should have. And, uh, and I thought, well, I'll, I really should do something about the family. And so that's what I chose to do. And this was really a lesson that I prepared for a marriage seminar that we did down in Coletro, uh, Mexico. And they asked us to come down and they really looked at the congregation, the men did, and chose some lessons and assigned them to us with various things that we all struggle with. And I think this is one of those things that we all struggle with. And in dealing with 1 Peter chapter 3, I really looked at this passage not just simply with mothers in mind, although it certainly has applications to mothers and for ladies, but I tried to look at it from trying to discover the principles that are involved because all of us live within a world of unbelievers. And we get together with family and we get together with friends and there's always people that are unbelievers that we must deal with. Now, obviously, in this particular passage, the sister that was involved or sisters that were involved were married to unbelievers. And Peter then gave instructions concerning them. But wouldn't you think that as we look at this particular passage that there would be some principles that, or some, some lessons that we could learn that would apply to our lives as we live with unbelievers. You know, I think back over the years and the number of times that we've got together as family, and no matter, as far as extended family is concerned, no matter what occasion it is, we get together and there's always some there that need to be instructed, need to be taught, need to learn a little bit more, need to be become a Christian, need to be... Uh, encouraged in some way. And that's always the case. It is always the fact that there are those around us who need to be taught. And it's a principle that really applied to us, as I said, to each one of us, not just simply to the wives, but it's also a great struggle that all of us deal with in dealing with those around us that are not Christians. And so what are then some things that we might learn? Now, my purpose in this is simply to encourage us to do what we need to do in order for others that might be able to hear and might be able to make these applications within their lives. But it's an encouragement to us as Christians to do these things. Well, from verse 1, I chose really three principles, I think, that really stand out in my mind. And that is... The first one is fulfill your God-given role. Now look at verse 1 again. There Peter said, Likewise ye wise, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation 
of their wives. Now, Peter began the entire section with, you ladies, you need to be in subjection to your husbands. Now, the principle then is, well, you just simply fulfill your God-given role. That's your number one thing that we have to do. Now, wouldn't that apply to anybody? Wouldn't that apply to husbands? Would it not be the case that if a husband was married to a lady that's not a member of the church, that he would need to fulfill his God-given role that given to him and the responsibilities that he has? Well, of course it is. And the same thing is true for the wives. And so it is the principle that the God-given roles must be fulfilled first. Now, I found it interesting when I think about faith and the different acts of faith that we do, all of them are in obedience to God. Now, God instructs us, and there's no doubt about that, and God provides the instruction for us, but a lot of times the instructions are simply a testing of faith, nothing more than that. And so it is that as we struggle through life and as we struggle with those members of the church that are not right before God, let's fulfill our God-given role. Roles may vary, but, but the principle is the same. And quite frankly, sometimes it may be the case that suffering might be the result of that. Peter in his letter really dealt with suffering all the way through the letter. And it may be the case that as we try to fulfill our God-given role, somebody will, well, why are you doing that? Why are you doing this? Why don't you live this way? And you'll solve yourself a lot of problems. But we have to fulfill the God-given roles. And the God-given roles really deal with priorities. You know, Jesus said that we are to love the Lord thy God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. There's where love has to begin. Well, the God-given role is that I'm going to fulfill that role first because God gave it to me. And since God gave it to me and I love him more than anyone else, then I'm going to fulfill that God-given role. Well, you know, I know that sometimes we don't like the idea, and I guess ego gets into the way, but, you know, we ought to encourage our spouse to love God more than they love us. Isn't that, isn't that true? Well, yeah, we ought to encourage our spouse to love God more than they love us. And though that sometimes is hard to deal with, but the fact is, it is a reality that love for God must take priority. Well, the second principle then that we find from verse 1 is attempt to teach. Attempt to teach. Now, going back to verse 1, he says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, the word, the, and I put that in quote, the word, it has to be used in two different ways in this particular passage. I don't know how you could understand the passage without understanding that particular principle, that it has to be understood in two different ways. A person cannot obey the gospel without the word of God. It's impossible that a person could obey without the word. And so the first time that he uses the word there in this particular passage has to be a reference to the New Testament, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because without it, there is no conversion whatsoever. But the second time the word or the words, the word is used has to be a reference to the word being taught by the wife. She has attempted to teach him and a very important aspect of any really relationship that we then attempt to teach the word that without the word he may be won by the conversation of the wife in other words then it is the attempt to teach and to teach in a public way or not a public way but to teach in a private way to uh, to that spouse well teaching is absolutely a part of the God-given role of a, of, a, uh, of a Christian. And, you know, different ones have talked about these various things and, 
And I always think about uh, different preachers that go to different places, but they will always talk about their responsibility is to teach. It isn't to police. It isn't to, to necessarily agree with everybody, but their responsibility is to teach. Well, change comes by gospel teaching. Without gospel teaching, there is no change. It takes place by gospel teaching. And, you know, Christianity, and I'm talking about the type we're talking about within the New Testament, is a taught religion. It's not inherited. It's not passed from generation to generation. And just because my parents were Christians or not Christians, it doesn't make any difference. It is not an inherited religion. It's not like Judaism. It isn't like Israel of old. You could be a, a, a member of or a citizen of the nation of Israel and never know who God was. And quite frankly, there were numerous times when that was the case. But the fact is, they inherited their religion. They inherited their nationality. That's not true. And it really isn't true with them as far as true Israel was concerned. But it's not true with Christianity. Christianity is a taught religion. And if we're not being taught, and if we're not teaching, we're not really fulfilling our responsibilities. Now, I think there is a difference, though, that sometimes... Some folks, they teach by demands. Other folks teach by reason. And there's a difference between the two. You know, you can tell everybody in the world, well, the Bible says that you have to be baptized. Okay, no problem there. It is the case, and our brother was talking about that earlier. It is the case that we ought to tell everybody they ought to be baptized. But doesn't it make a lot more sense, though, rather than just demanding them to be baptized, is to reason with them, show the purpose of baptism, show what leads to baptism, that they'll be led to the act of obedience, and then build their faith in the process of it so they'll have enough faith to act upon their faith and be baptized, immersed into Christ, and raised up to walk in newness of life. Well, the same thing is true with a spouse. The same thing is true with a family member that we're concerned with. We then lead them to obedience to the gospel. And so it is that we attempt to teach by reasoning as, the, uh, as what really is directed by the scriptures. But then a third principle is that if teaching fails, then live godly. A godly example is always appropriate. And as one gospel preacher wrote in his commentary, sometimes a silent example is better than vehement debate. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's a pretty good way of thinking about it, you know, that, that we can get into all the arguments that we want, but, you know, sometimes it's just better just to be the godly example that we ought to be. And that silent, <laughs> godly example will lead, uh, hopefully, to the salvation of our spouse's soul. I always think about this lady I knew years and years ago. I knew her, and I knew her daughters, and I knew her, or we knew her and her daughters and her grandchildren. We didn't know the grandfather, but the, one of the grandsons told me about this. And the grandfather, most of his life, he was not a member of the church. But the grandmother, she came to services week after week when the church doors were open, the church building doors were open, she was there. She was an example. And because of her example, she was able to convert most of her family. And as a result of her conversion of most of her family, her grandchildren, most of them were members of the church as well. But I remember the grandson telling us one day about the grandfather toward the end of his life. He got to worried about his, his wife and going to services, so he would bring her to services, which was about 30 miles away, and uh, they lived out on a farm. He would bring her to services, 
but he wouldn't come in. He'd just drop her off and go do something else and come back. Well, he got kind of tired of that about a year into it, maybe two years. So then he would wait till services started and he'd come in and sit down at the back row. Well, as time progressed, he started sitting with her toward the front. And as time progressed, I remember the grandson telling me, he said, I turned around to granddad and I said, I'm ready to become a Christian. What about you? And the old man was baptized into Christ. But you know where it all went back to? Well, it went back to his wife who taught, tried to teach by word. He was obstinate. He would not listen, but she continued to teach by example. And her example exemplified what she taught by word. That's the principle that's involved in this passage. And it's true whether it's a woman or whether it's a man. It's true whether we are nephews or nieces or whether we're uncles or aunts. It makes no difference. It's true if we're going to teach our family to be members of the Lord's church. A third or a fourth principle that, that we find within this passage is the one I took, the next one I took is from verse 4. And verse 4 says, But let, the, let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now in looking at this particular passage, of course, he contrasted two sides. He contrasted the physical appearance of a, of a lady to the spiritual appearance of that lady. And he really pointed out the, the real important things. I mean, let's face the facts. I mean, we all get older and we all age and, it, and we're not the, we don't look the same as we did when we were younger. Now, some of us age gracefully, <laughs> but not all, all of us do that. Well, you know, the fact is, we all change, and, there, and all of us are different than we, we used to be. But the principle is, you be more concerned with the inner self than you be concerned with the outer self. And he talked about two different things. He talked about a meek spirit and a quiet spirit. Now, meekness is a quality of setting aside your own will to do the will of another. Now, as Christians, we set aside our own will to do the will of God. In other words, oh yeah, it'd be really nice to go, uh, Don, it'd be nice to go fishing on Sunday morning, go catching some whatever the fish that you like to catch. Well, you know, that'd be nice to do that. But you know, I have to set aside my own will to do the will of the Father. It's more important for me to be right here where I am, to be in services. I have to set aside my own will to do the will of the Father. The same thing is true with whether you're talking about Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday evening, whatever it might be. It might be the case that the church is going to go do something for a gospel meeting or something like that. We have to set aside our own will. Oh yeah, I'd rather be doing, well, whatever it might be. We set aside our own will to do the will of the Father. And that really applies to more than just simply attendance, doesn't it? Well, of course it does. But doesn't that apply to marriage too sometimes? That sometimes we have to set aside our own will to do the will of our spouse? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is often the case that we have to do that. Well, if we're going to convert that spouse, or if we're going to convert others that are within our family, sometimes we have to set aside our own will. Our wills are not so important that we can't set them aside on occasions. The second term or the principle that he spoke in that passage, the type of spirit that we have, not only a meek spirit, but a quiet spirit. Now, the word quiet there doesn't mean like silent. And sometimes people look at that and they think, think that that's what it means, but it really has more the idea of being peaceable. You know, Christians ought to be a peaceable people. And that's the opposite of being disruptive. 
Now we all know people that are disruptive, that are always causing problems, and I always think about certain aunt. I mean, my, my dad was one of 12 of those kids, and uh, he had nine sisters and two brothers. And there was one sister of his, one aunt of mine. I mean, I think there was never anything ever right. I mean, she could complain about everything and usually did on family occasions complain just about about everything, just about about everything. Well, that's the opposite of this. A quiet spirit is a peaceful spirit. It doesn't always mean that we're going to agree, but whether we agree or not, we're going to be peaceable. That's the difference there. And we have to have that peaceable spirit. But certainly it is the case for wives, and that's specifically the application that he made, but isn't it also true for the rest of us as well, that we have to be peaceable? And sometimes that requires a lot of different ways of thinking about things, but we have to be peaceable in that. It's interesting, the, the other time that that particular word is used is over in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 2. And this is an exhortation concerning prayer. And he said that we are to pray for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And that's, the, that's one of the same words, that we might lead a peaceable and quiet life. And most commentaries agree, and, and dictionaries agree, that it's the idea of having peace on the outside, but having peace on the inside as well. And so we pray for our government. And you think about Paul when he prayed for Rome, or Timothy in this exhortation as he prayed for Rome. They lived under the Roman Empire, and yet they prayed for Rome. Not for Rome to continue to exist, not for Rome to, to, to be able to keep their soldiers from harm or whatever it might be, but he prayed for that nation in order that the Christians could lead a peaceable and quiet life, that they could be a peaceable people and deal with others. Well, then notice at the end of uh, verse 4, there's a statement that he made. He said, concerning the God of great price. Well, it's, it's great price is not an adjective that modifies God, but is act, actually an adjective that modifies the spirit of meekness and of the spirit of quietness, the, the spirit of peace. You see... The lady that has that quit, quiet spirit, that lady that has that meek spirit, she's like Sarah. And she's of great value, and that's what the word actually means, of tremendous value to God. Well, is that not true with anybody that, that has that kind of a spirit? If we have a meek and quiet spirit in the sight of God, we are of great price to him, great value to him. Well, the final principle that I chose is found in verse 6, where he says, Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Well, the principle is that no matter what, no matter how family situations are, we must trust God. The, the fashionable person is a person that really looks to self and looks at the outward image. But you know, really, it, when you look at this and you put it in context, what, it, what basically Peter exhorted was, you be fashioned with trust. That's the actual ex exhortation. <laughs> You be fashioned as a godly person who trusts in God. Fashion after trust or after hope or confidence. And no need to be afraid with terror. And of course, this is applied to the, the wife that's living godly. 
and she has that meek and quiet spirit, don't be afraid of the husband. There's no reason to be afraid of, of him. You just continue living and you trust in God that, and live the way that God wants you to live. That's the, the idea. Well, isn't that true with all of us? No matter what comes upon us, no matter what might be outside against us and opposed to us, no matter what relationship that we might have with others within the family, we still must trust God. And like I told one gospel preacher, he was bemoaning the fact that eh, he was getting a little bit of persecution, not anything of real extreme. I mean, it didn't come to blood or anything like that. And that's what I told him. But I said, and even if it did, I mean, what's the harm here? I mean, all they'll do is send you to your reward early. I mean, that's the reality, you know? But the, uh, most likely, at least not in the United States, is going to come to that. Although it has, and sometimes uh, in the past it has come to that. But nonetheless, it, uh, it probably will not come to that. And so we don't have to be afraid of such things. You know, the only thing that we really ought to fear is God. And not fear Him like you fear, fear a bear, but you fear Him like you have respect for Him. And God will take care of us in any situation. So five principles that will help us to deal with family members and living in a world of unbelievers. Fulfill your God-given role. Attempt to teach. When teaching fails or if teaching fails, live godly. And see and remember that God sees godly, the godly, the meek and quiet spirit, as of great value. And above all, trust in God. The ungodly press against the godly. There's no doubt about it. We feel it all the time. You go into Walmart, and you've been there and done that, where the ungodly, you feel like it's everywhere around you. You're, and some days it's worse than others, and you can't get away from it, it doesn't seem like. Well, you still apply the principles and they that are ungodly that live around us will continue doing what they do most likely but these will be of great value and a great benefit to each one of us if we simply do what God exhorted through the Apostle Peter this morning we do want to offer the invitation. There may be someone here that have never named the name of Christ but obedience to his gospel plan. If we can help you with that obedience, then we invite you to come. But more, more probable is the fact that there may be someone that have, that have named that marvelous name but have drifted away, wandered away, and need the strength and the prayers of the church. If we can help you in any way, we invite you to come as together we stand and sing to encourage you.